Old Age Museum and Educational Center. I grew up in Connecticut and I immediately went to New York City and worked in the theater community. In the 1980s, the theater community, Times Square and Broadway, it was pretty rough. People were dying once a week. You were going to your funeral every week. Um, you knew a lot of people that were passing away to it. And it was new and it was different and you didn't have answers. And it was tough. Um, New York City was in the 80s, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Uh, yes, it was a very sad time, but also, too, it was a very good time for other things. I met some of the most wonderful people in my life. I had some of the most wonderful experiences in my life. And um, in that time in New York, I met some great people. Not many of them are still with us, um, including probably my first love, which was Roger. Uh, he was, I guess, my first official boyfriend. And um, I was 26 and he was 48. And um, and he died of AIDS. And I guess he was the first person close to me that passed away. Uh, first person I was intimate with that passed away. My career was just starting and I was climbing. And he had had success in his early younger man days. Um, he was Ambrose Kemper in Purbelly's Hello, Dolly. So 20 years later, in the 1980s, um, he was having trouble finding work. Things weren't easy for him. Not probably the man I thought I'd fall in love with, a short black man. Um, but we shared the love of theater and music and dining, and we cared about each other a lot. He kept going to his doctor and could not figure out why he was coughing and having these respiratory problems. So finally, he did find out he was HIV positive. My reaction to him was, okay, well, you have it and I don't. Um, let's just do what we have to do. See your doctor, do what the doctor tells you. Um, as far as sex, we started to drift apart. I had to be safe as well. But so there was no more sexual contact, but we still cared very much for each other. And so the emotion was there, and so it was very emotionally difficult for both of us to know what to do and where to go now that things have changed. So it started to create a bit of a problem between the two of us. And yes, we did break up. He pulled away from me because he did not want to hurt me. My career wasn't very well. I was struggling and, you know, was sad over that. And by this time, it was 1990. So at this point, 1990, we had both lived through the 1980s in New York and been through a lot. So I decided to leave New York City. I moved out to California in a little town called Fairfield, just outside of San Francisco. There, they had a whole different idea and approach to being HIV positive or to being gay. I got a job as the artistic director of the PWA Theater, Persons of AIDS Theater. Um, and we were doing support groups and we were writing plays that had to do with being about HIV and being positive and also using the plays. And the theater company is a fundraiser for raising AIDS awareness and education. And I was not HIV at that point, but it was tough too. The play that I wrote called Burt's Big Bed was about two guys who meet and um, in a bar, and then one of them has to tell the other one that he's HIV positive. So it's really about communication. Um, in this time, 1990-91, we've already had plays such as Torch Song, um, Normal Heart, so we've already had it kind of like the HIV AIDS plays. Now the plays are much more being focused in upon relationship and communication. And one of the actors playing Dolores, this actor named Ben, um, we're trying to do some rehearsal and I'm trying to direct him in a certain way and tell him to do it this way or that way. And he comes at me and says, what do you know about our pain, Mary? You're not on the bus. And it really bothered me because I felt I was a member of the community. I felt I knew what this was about and I felt I was being supportive, yet I'm not on the bus. <laughs> so how can I truly know how it really truly feels 
what these guys are going through. One night I went to New York City to do a show and I was going into the coat check room to change my costume. And after I changed my costume, I was going to go on stage and sing a song. So here I am in the coat check room at the Lure, 1994. And someone comes up to the door to check his coat. And it was Roger. I uh, hadn't seen Roger in four years. And it was nice. It was nice to say goodbye and um, talk um, and know that we both still cared about one another and that he was okay and uh, doing good and and learning from his experience. After that, I kept trying to track him down, find someone who may have known him. Um, and so, yeah, the only really place I really ever found Roger was, uh, I looked, he, he was born in Westchester County. So I did find a tombstone in Westchester County. He was buried through the Actors' Equity Memorial Fund. At least he is in a good place and happy. And uh, I'm kind of glad I got to see him that last time and was able to say goodbye. He said I moved to Florida in 94. I was involved in gay games and went to the gay games in New York City, was the events coordinator for Stonewall's 25th anniversary in New York City. I concentrate on being a community activist and involved in the community. Um, and so I ignored my career, I ignored relationships. There was an organization here in town called the Wansiki Foundation. And Marie was a wonderful lady who started the Wansiki Foundation. She did an annual event called the Black Heart Ball. And I was involved with that uh, event for a couple of years. At this point, I was producing it and went to her office. It was January of 2002. And uh, she said, before we talk about the event, I have something else to tell you. And she told me I was HIV positive. I had taken a test uh, in December. I usually took my annual test every year, once a year. I was dating someone. He was an artist, handsome, artistic, wonderful, sweet, kind, and I loved him. I loved him. And I knew that he was positive and I was negative. And I continued to date him. Now, why or how or some of these answers just can't be answered. So I do believe how I acquired HIV was orally, which I know is hard to get. But I had very bad dental. Uh, some of the back teeth were broken. And I believe I got HIV positive through oral sex. First year was a bit of a shock. I really blame myself a lot because in a way I said, well, I'm involved in the community. I know what to do. How could I make that big mistake? I should have known better. And I did start blaming the other person. And then at one point you come to a point where <laughs> you kind of find a middle ground where it's not their fault, it's not your fault. Six months into this, I blurted out to mom and dad that I was HIV positive. Lots of crying. Um, I, I was a little shocked at dad, who is a very cold Italian man, how emotional he was about it. Um, mom, being Irish, she shut down and she just went to the kitchen and did dishes and didn't want to deal with it. Um, after that initial episode where I told mom and dad, um, dad just didn't want to talk about it and didn't want to talk about me being gay, didn't want to talk about being HIV. He really just kind of just ignored it. But mom was a little more sympathetic. She uh, learned a little bit here and there. So um, she asked questions once or twice. Um, and she's been supportive of it. About a year after I found out, here I am with HIV, here I am with an eyesight problem and cannot work, and I just went home to die. <laughs> um, stay home with mom and dad and, and become a nuisance and didn't know what to do. So I stayed with mom and dad for about four years. It was a difficult four years being a 40-year-old man uh, and then we get home with mom and dad. With the eyesight situation, 
I did find a doctor and I found treatment and I've had several operations for the eyesight. So after four years of these rings and lenses in, implanted in my eyes, I can see again. Um, so the four years started off to be difficult, but actually it was kind of good to kind of, for several reasons. One, it was a connection with mom and dad and they got to know me a little bit closer, a little more personally, which was good. Um, I got to see doctors more often. I went to the gym uh, and I became much more healthier. Um, I'm a healthier person because of HIV. Coming back to South Florida after four years, people had changed and I had changed. Um, so I really got rid of the negative people in my life. A lot of the friends I had four years prior to that, when I say, when I'm HIV and they're HIV and I told them, they would say the same thing that guy in San Francisco did, well, you're on the bus now or, or get over it, just take your meds. Having an education ahead of time and knowing what to do and where to go um, was really, really helpful. For example, when I did first learn that first day um, and the very next day when I saw the doctor and she wanted to put me on protease inhibitors to really block it and hit it hard, I went, whoa, 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 whoa. That's too strong. I said, I am have it, but I'm not hospitalization sick. I'm okay. I'm standing right in front of you. So I stopped her from giving me some hard protease inhibitors. Um, they put me on Viramune and Epsicom, and I've been on that, that medication for 12 years. I started saving my HIV medicine bottles. After 10 years of saving the bottles, <laughs> I had three giant garbage bags in the closet. I finally said, okay, I've got to stop. It was going to be a sculpture, but I don't know if it was going to be a star or an exclamation point. But of course, once you have them all spread out and you start moving them around, it definitely was going to be a red ribbon. I'm shocked and honored on how what a life it's taken on um, because it became quite a piece of art. Um, people really like it and connect with it. Uh, the 417 bottles, if each bottle is $800 worth of medication times 417 came out to about be about $333,000 worth of medication. This is the piece I'm working on. When you have HIV and these medications, the medication will accumulate into your belly. It's called Quick's belly. So there's a medication called Grifta. I was on a trial for it about eight years ago, and it seemed to work really well. And I've been on it about maybe two years right now, and it works really well. My problem is you have to inject a needle into your belly every morning.